She is, by way of her formal background, the Director of Game Research and Development at the Institute for the Future. She's been featured in The Economist, Wired, The New York Times, MTV, CNN, and PR. In 2009, Business Week called her one of the 10 most important innovators to watch, and she's since, she's since then uh, received a number of other accolades as well. And we're extremely fortunate that not only uh, we have Jane here today you know, sharing some new insight with us in a brand new keynote, but also that today is a launch of Jane's new book, which will be, uh, which will be signing, Jane will be signing uh, after her keynote. Following Jane's keynote, we have a uh, Q&A with Liz Gans from All Things D and the Wall Street Journal. So we'll get some of those questions. Liz will, uh, Liz will, I'm sure, be sharing some of her insights for you after Jane's keynote. But now, without any further ado, and thank you so much, we're so excited to have you, Jane McGonigal. Thank you, Gabe. So this is a true story. I was so excited about the Gamification Summit that I woke up at 2 in the morning and I couldn't get back to sleep until 4.30. So uh, I think this is a really momentous day to have so many people here coming together to figure out what kind of future we want to make in terms of making the world work more like a game. I have a uh, strange request for you a little bit. If you have a cell phone with you, I'd like you to take it out and maybe set it to vibrate. You might have it turned off all the way. And uh, I'll tell you why in a little bit. What I want to talk to you about today is making it gameful, which is a, a little bit different from gamification. So gamification, at least in its first generation, is about making something game-like, making it look like a game, making it structured like a game. The next generation of gamification, I think, will be about making it game full, making it feel like a game. Now let's see if I can learn how to work this clicker. So game full is actually, it's a word I coined, and it means to have the spirit of a good game, to really capture the emotions that we have when we play a good game. The thing about a game that is really interesting is that when you are playing a game, you know you're playing a game. You can just feel it. You don't have to, somebody doesn't have to tell you that it's a game. You get it from the minute you're in it. There's a certain kind of spirit that all games have in common. And I think we can start to explore what that spirit really is. You know, we've seen a lot of gamification projects so far that have all the bells and whistles of a game, but maybe don't yet have the heart of a game. You know, we're starting to add things like points and levels and leaderboards and achievement badges, but maybe at the core of the activity, we could be doing more to insert that spirit of gamefulness. So that's the question that I think we all need to be able to answer if we're going to be gamifying anything. What does it feel like to play a good game? And that's how we can measure the success of our gamification. So I have some good news for you, which I will reveal when the clicker works. Aha, aha. Yes, so good news for you. I have made you a game because it's the Gamification Summit, so I thought I would gamify my talk. And that's why you have your cell phones out. Now, the thing about this game, it will make it a little bit harder to follow what I'm saying, but I give you full permission to ignore what I'm saying if you like the game. You can read my book and hear a lot of these ideas later. So feel free to completely ignore me if you're into the game. That's totally cool. So here's how it'll work. To play the game, you're gonna SMS your first name to this number. And you can play the game through the end of my session. So we can play through, it'll be about 12.30. This number is gonna be on the screen for about five more slides. Once it's gone, you can't play the game anymore. So make sure you get in the game if you want to. All right, let me tell you a little bit about myself. This slide pretty much sums up my feelings about games. I uh, saw this piece of graffiti in my neighborhood. I show it all the time, so maybe some of you have seen it before. And, and it really sparked me to think about the fact that when we're in games, we're often better versions of ourselves. We feel more confident, we feel more successful, we're more motivated to collaborate, to rise to the heroic occasion. And so I wanted to go and figure out why that was. I went to University of California at Berkeley, got a PhD studying who we become when we play games and how that can trickle over into the real world. 
After I got my PhD, I went to the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California, and I've spent the last several years there researching this increasingly porous boundary between games and real life, looking at new technologies and new cultural phenomena that can help us take what's awesome about games and put it into the real world. While uh, I've been at IFTF, I published a report that I think is really one of the earliest statements of gamification. It's called The Engagement Economy. It's free online. You can download it if you're interested. Um, and this was really about looking for ways that we could take all of the engagement of games and put it into our real world work and our real world products and services. So I encourage you to look that up if you want. It's the last slide to get the phone number if you're thinking about playing. This is it. So it all leads up to my uh, writing this book, which is out today. So the happy birthday to my book. And this book presents 14 things that are not as engaging in the real world as they are in games and proposes 14 ways that we can fix that. I'm going to talk to you about just two of those fixes today. But first, I should tell you, if you're going to write a book about why we should make the real world work more like a game, you have to have a pretty good definition of a game because people are like, what does that mean? Does that mean there's going to be 3D graphics everywhere and there's going to be like virtual swords, like games, winners? What does it mean? So uh, I have a definition for a game. I really like this definition. This is actually not my definition. Somebody else coined it. Uh, a guy named Bernard Suits, a great philosopher of play, and I've adopted it as my own. So this definition is that games are unnecessary obstacles that we volunteer to tackle. Now notice there's nothing in here about interactivity, or winning, or competition, or graphics, or missions. All we have are unnecessary obstacles that we volunteer to tackle. Now what does this mean? Let's look at a great, a timeless game, a game that absorbs countless hours every week, golf. Now in golf, you have a goal. Your goal is to get a tiny little ball in a series of holes. Now if this were real life, what would we do to achieve this goal? We would walk over to the hole, and we would drop the ball in the hole. But for some reason, because we're playing a game, we agree to stand really far away from the hole and use a stick to hit the ball. And to make it even more complicated, we put traps and hazards in the way. Now, if this were real life, what would we try to do? We would try to invent a process in which you could get the balls in the holes as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, make it as easy as possible, but instead, because we're playing a game, we make it as challenging as possible, right? Why do we do this? Why is it that golf becomes a game when we make it harder? Well, the key word here is you stress. This is a term that means positive stress. And the thing that all games have in common is it creates positive stress in our lives. You stress is identical physiologically, biochemically, to negative stress, right? We get our adrenaline going, our heart pumping, we maybe breathe harder, our concentration and attention centers of the brain become much more focused and heightened. It's physiologically the same thing as when we're encountering a danger or a threat. But because we've chosen a particular challenge, we experience it as a positive physical sensation. We experience it as an opportunity to challenge ourselves. So we start to see things as challenges rather than threats, as opportunities rather than dangers. And when we're under a state of use stress, it drives our performance. So we're more motivated, we're more likely to set ambitious goals, we're more likely to reach out to others to achieve those goals, and we become these heightened versions of ourselves. We love to have this feeling, and that's why we play games most often when we're bored. There's this great quote by the dramatist Noel Coward. He says, you know what? It seems to me that work is more fun than fun. And this is something I absolutely believe that games have shown to be true. Games are work that we volunteer for, challenges we volunteer for, in order to create a state of eustress, a positive stress. We don't like hanging around being relaxed when we're bored, when we're frustrated, when we're uninspired, we want to tap into that feeling of being challenged to become better versions of ourselves. So look at the most popular games today. These are nothing but unnecessary obstacles. Angry Birds. I've read that this will uh, take, I believe, 200 million minutes worth of time every day this week from players playing this game. 
And what are you doing? You're, you're doing this obstacle of trying to tear down pigs' houses. You're getting revenge on the pigs. This is totally unnecessary work. And you've got this ridiculous, absurd way that you have to do it by sending birds through a slingshot. But we do this because we would rather feel challenged than to be sitting around feeling bored, right? We want that little bit of eustress while we're sitting on the train or we're in the meeting. Take Dance Central, for example. If you wanted to dance, why don't you just dance? But lots of people play this game who would never dance in ordinary life because it turns dance into a series of unnecessary obstacles. You have to dance like that person. You have to learn specific moves like Superman or Face the Roof. You guys know this, you're playing Connect, right? So we can unlock our ability to dance when we put these unnecessary obstacles in the way because now we're under you stress instead of negative stress where maybe we feel socially awkward, right? Farmville, what do we even have to say about Farmville? Farmville is work. Farmville is super work. I know because when I was writing my book, I was playing this game for an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening because it was the only thing that I could do that felt productive. Writing my book did not feel productive. It felt like I would never be done, and I had no idea if it was any good, but I could go onto my farm, and I could make my farm perfect and help all my friends, right? And we know this is work. Even games like Call of Duty, right? The number one pastime for soldiers who are actively serving in the military, in the US military, is playing Call of Duty and Halo. When they're not serving in the military, they escape by serving in the virtual military. It's crazy. But when you talk to them, they talk about the positive feelings that they have of being so able to control and succeed and be powerful in these military environments. It doesn't make sense. They escape to exactly what they do in real life. But it's you stress. And then, of course, you have World of Warcraft, which is an example that I love. Because in order to get to the highest level, where many players say the fun really starts, you have to put in, on average, 600 hours of gameplay. Now, what kind of system is there that you would have to put in 600 hours just to get to the fun part, right? It's really incredible how, how we are drawn to this unnecessary work. Because the quests, they challenge us. The raids, they challenge us. This is such a wonky clicker. Now, I'm obsessed with this number because I think it's a great number to share with potential clients or people in your organization when they ask, why do you want to gamify? What are we really going to get out of gamification? You know? So 5.93 million years is how long people have spent going around tackling unnecessary obstacles in World of Warcraft. And this is a great number because 5.93 million years ago was literally the moment in human history that our first ancestors stood up. The very first primate stood up. So we spent as long playing World of Warcraft as we have evolving as a human species. And it's not just World of Warcraft, right? Come on, awesome slide. You can do it. So we're, play we're spending quite a lot of time playing these other games too, right? 3.2 years for Bejeweled. The Halo's racked up a quarter of a billion million years so far. Rock Band, kind of newcomer on the scene, 57,000 years. You know, but it's really interesting because we're, you know, the only way it makes sense to talk about the magnitude of gameplay that we're playing is at the scale of human evolution. And of course, I think that's because it's changing who we are as a species and what we're capable of. You know, so as a result, here's another great number to share with clients and, and uh, people in your organization to get them interested in tapping into games. We invest three billion hours weekly as a planet playing online games because we are not challenged enough in our real lives. We are not positively stressed enough in our real lives. You know, there's a comment earlier on a panel that I, I, I would actually provide a twist to. I don't think gamification is about making things fun and easier for our, for our players or for our users. Because games aren't about making anything easier. It is always harder to play a game than to just sit there and do nothing, right? Games are about tackling things that are hard for us for the fun of it. Ooh, thank you. Level four players in the house. So, of course, you want to figure out why are we spending so much time tackling unnecessary obstacles? You know, what is it about you stress that we love? This is a great quote I love from an early uh, theorist of play, Brian Sutton Smith. He said, the opposite of play isn't work, it's depression. This is something I've been tinkering with a lot since I heard it for the first time a number of years ago. You know, if you look at the clinical definition for depression, it combines two states. The first is a pessimistic sense of your own capabilities, 
And the second is a despondent lack of energy. Okay, now if you were to reverse these two traits, you would get an optimistic sense of our own capabilities and an invigorating rush of energy. Now there's no clinical psychological term for being in that state, but I would propose that that is a perfect definition of what it feels like to play a game. So games are a chance to optimistically engage with something that we're good at and that we enjoy. And if you look at the faces of gamers, this is a series of portraits taken of gamers while they were playing games. I look at this all the time because I think this is the benchmark of a good game, right? Here's somebody who is working hard. You can tell he's tackling some tough obstacles, you know, and you get this kind of grit and determination and sort of fiendish sense of being empowered when you play. And sometimes it's really, really hard and we make faces like that. And uh, sometimes we just get really blissed out with our own productivity. I love that girl. Sometimes we're scared at how challenging the game is. This guy looks like he's really scared. You know, I always say that this looks to me like someone who's on the verge of an epic win, on the verge of doing better than he thought possible, but probably he's gonna fail a, a number of times because you can see that, that he's, you know, he's really working beyond his abilities. Thank you, amen. But this guy, this guy, he's on the other side of the epic win, right? So this is like a before and after. Before the epic win, this is the after of the epic win. He's just amazed himself with what he's capable of. This is why we go into straits of states of eustress. This is why we crave them. Because we want to feel like this at the end of the day. We want to feel like, hot damn, did I do that? That's why we play games. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Clicker time. So, you know, I like to talk about these four quintessential gamer feelings that we get when we're in the state of eustress, with this idea of urgent optimism, where we feel like there's some heroic purpose that we must, we must rise to the occasion to help serve, but we also feel like we have the skills and abilities to achieve it. That's the feeling of urgent optimism. This feeling of social fabric, that when we play games with people, that we get a better understanding of what they're good at. We start to trust them and like each other more. And that's a feeling that we can get when we're under a state of eustress together. Amen. Amen. This feeling of blissful productivity, where we are just so happy with the work we're doing. It's rewarding work. We're getting positive feedback. We're seeing the impact of our efforts on the world. We'd love to see, at the end of the day, what we accomplish, right? We go into the state of blissful productivity. And then we have this feeling of epic meaning, where we're serving a cause that's bigger than ourselves. And in some games, it's a mythology. It's a sweeping heroic narrative. In other games, it's a massively multiplayer community. And in some new social games, it's a real world social cause. But people want, at the end of the day, to be connected to something bigger than themselves, to have these feelings of awe and wonder and be inspired. So when you add up all of these four quintessential gamer feelings, you get what at the Institute for the Future we call super empowered, hopeful individuals, or SEHIs for short. And, and this is what I really want to say to you, is that if you're trying to make something gameful, if you're trying to gamify something, this is what you should be looking to generate. You should be looking to turn your users, or your consumers, or your community, or your students, or your patrons, or whoever you're trying to gauge, turn them into super empowered, hopeful individuals, because that's who we become when we play a good game. Amen. Now, I want to show you four examples that I think are really doing a great job of not just being game-like, but being gameful. And I'm sure you'll have seen these before, so I'll go through them quickly. If not, be sure to look them up online. One of the most successful gamification efforts ever, you easily would have to say, is this project from the University of Washington, where scientists working in biochemistry invented a game that allowed users, players, to help try to cure cancer. So they would go into this 3D environment, learn how to fold proteins in new ways, and then try to beat supercomputers, which were previously our best scientific method for folding proteins in new ways, try and beat them with their creativity and their, their gamer desire to overcome incredible obstacles. And this year, the scientists, along with more than 50,000 gamers, co-authored a paper that was published in Nature Journal, the most prestigious scientific journal co-authored, uh, published a co-authored paper with 50,000 gamers, gamers who had no training, 
in biomedicine or biochemistry before they play this game. You want to talk about taking something really hard and gamifying it and then turning the people who play that game into super empowered, hopeful individuals. This is an amazing example. Amen. Now, some of the people who worked on that game have a new game that's just out now that you might not have seen. It's called Eterna. And here you get to create new kinds of RNA, and then the scientists take the best scoring virtual RNA and they make it in the lab for real. And then they actually test real RNA designed by gamers. So it says here, played by humans, scored by nature. Talk about something that would actually inspire you and create a state of eustress, this opportunity to work with scientists to do real science. Amen. This is fun. I like this game. <laughs> So some of you may have seen Investigate Your MP's Expenses. This was a game done by The Guardian, the newspaper in the UK, and they needed help investigating corrupt politicians. The government had dumped nearly half a million secret documents, expenses, receipts, and uh, blacked out lots of them and made it really impossible to, to go through them in any reasonable way. So they put them online, they made a game, they got more than 27,000 gamers to go through looking for evidence of political corruption, and as a result, politicians resigned. New laws were passed. These 27,000 gamers had a direct impact on, on public policy and on politics in their country just by playing an online game. Now, the reason why games like this work is that it's actually awesome to investigate corrupt politicians. You could make a game about looking at government documents that, that were boring and not inspiring, but this is a great example of finding something that actually will cultivate feelings of curiosity and wonder and excitement and adventure. Um, there's a great platform that I'm a big fan of called Ground Crew. Uh, you're actually using that platform now if you're playing my gamified talk game. And they're looking for real world opportunities for people to help uh, out in real life the same way we help people in games. So if you play Farmville, you know you get all these requests to help your neighbor to go water their crops, fertilize their crops, feed their chickens. Well, this is a platform that when you're walking down the street, it can tell you, hey, there's an urban garden around the corner. Will you please water a real crop? Will you please fertilize real vegetables? And then you have the same sense of you stress being activated to do this cool thing, the same thing we're doing in our games, but doing them in the real world. And this last one's kind of a secret. That's why it has question marks around it. It's a new game I'm doing with the New York Public Library. The New York Public Library wanted a game to get young people re-engaged with libraries. Young people today do not use libraries, right? They go online, they use Wikipedia. But there's a lot of amazing stuff at libraries and amazing people. So how do we get young people to the library? They wanted a game, they wanted to gamify it. Well, we could have made a game where you got points for every time you came to the library or you got achievement badges for checking out different books, but that's not the direction we're going. We're going hopefully next generation of gamification. What we're doing is we've made a game where if you play it, you write a book, and then the book goes in the library's permanent collection. And we're kicking it off with an all night, stay up all night, write all night game, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., 500 gamers, locked in the library overnight, nobody leaves till they write a book. And we think that this is gonna tap into gamers' sense of having an authentic goal Many, many young people want to write a book. We're going to help them achieve something that feels super empowered. And then hopefully we'll change their relationship to the library. Once they have a book in the library, that library becomes home. So these are the four things that every game designer knows how to create. Blissful productivity, social fabric, urgent optimism, and epic meaning. It's much harder to create these things than it is to design points, levels, leaderboards, and achievement badges. But this is what a game feels like, and we have to have more than just the structure. The structure is so important, and it's, it's the foundation for gamification efforts. But now we have to move into the heart and soul. If you're wondering where you can learn to do those four things, I founded earlier this year with two amazing people who are here in the room. I want to encourage you all, if you all can raise your hands, we've got Matt Jensen and Nathan Verrill, founders of Natron Baxter and co-founders of Gameful.org. This is a secret headquarters for people who want to use games to change the world, to have a real positive impact on their business, on schools, on their neighborhoods, on people's lives. You can come here and learn from real game designers, collaborate, find you know, working professional game developers who want to help also change the world. So in conclusion, this is how you know if you're doing it right. 
If you are making games that are truly gameful, if you're gamifying something to have the heart and soul of a game, these are the faces that you'll see on your players. And that's what I think, at the end of the day, we should be looking for. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. We'll grab a seat, we'll grab those out with you. That was amazing, right? Awesome, awesome. Now, uh, just every minute of that was inspiring. Thank you so much. That was really tremendous, and uh, it, it was really great to, uh, to hear that, Jane. Tremendous, tremendous. I want to introduce to you all um, Liz Gans. Liz is the senior editor of Network Effect at All Things D in the Wall Street Journal. Many of you know her. She's been a business technology reporter since 2004. She was uh, originally at the Red Herring, which is like total blast from the past to, to think about Red Herring, but I am old enough to remember the Red Herring. Um, she was uh, the second employee at uh, tech blog Gigom, and uh, she covered the rise of the social web there, which is probably where uh, most of you know her from. And uh, Liz, is, Liz is gonna spend uh, basically the next 15 minutes or so uh, in a kind of casual Q&A with Jane over there. So I want to welcome Liz to the, to the stage. And uh, afterwards, we'll have a chance for, uh, for Q&A with the audience. So thanks so much. Welcome, Liz. Yeah, we'll get you some. Hi, I'm Liz. Um, I know usually after a church revival session, you don't sit down with the preacher to ask them questions. <laughs> But I feel kind of like that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, Jane, um, I know that you are, in addition to launching your book today, starting to put some of these ideas into practice, making some of these games yourself. In your book, you describe how you've made a lot of different parts of your life um, fun and motivational and engaging um, by creating games for yourself. So I was hoping maybe you could go into some of the more specifics of what you're working on in this front. Yeah, sure. Um, all right, so in the book, I had a funny thing happen to me while I was writing the book, um, which was I hit my head and had a mild traumatic brain injury, a concussion, um, and it didn't heal properly. So after 30 days, I still couldn't read or write. I couldn't, you know, think clearly. I couldn't be social. This was like really problematic when I was on sabbatical to write a book and I couldn't even read or write. Um, so, uh, I, and it was a very stressful time, a time full of depression and anxiety. And it's one of the problems with head injuries is that it provokes feelings of depression and anxiety at, at a neurochemical level. So in addition to being actually depressed about what's going on, you're also incredibly biochemically depressed. Um, and my doctor told me that in order to break, you know, to, to get better, I had to break that cycle because depression and anxiety prevent the brain from healing. So I wound up making a game um, to help me get better. Um, and I actually, I credit the game with saving my life. Um, it's called Super Better. I write about it in the book. Um, but I'm actually, I have a new company called Social Chocolate um, that actually our director of design today in the orange hat, if you're interested in, in hearing more about our ideas. Um, we're, one of our first games is this game Super Better. We're doing clinical trials and we're trying to make it possible for people with any injury or illness to feel gameful about the process of getting better, um, to sort of reduce the suffering, increase the social support, increase the optimism, and uh, really the clinical trials will be starting this spring on that game, so really excited. And I should mention that the reason I awkwardly carried my laptop up here is because I was hoping that I would be able to incorporate questions that you're tweeting. Um, so. My handle is um, my first name and my last name, Liz Gaines, so L-I-Z-G-A-N-N-E-S. I think it's probably easiest if you just send me an at message and I'll look at it right here. Um, so what does that mean? Um, how will you release this game? What platforms will it be on and when might we see to ex when might be expected? So uh, yeah, we're hoping to have it be playable in a beta version um, by the public this summer. And there will be an app version and also an online version. And it will connect with all kinds of social media. So um, you're meant to play this game with close friends and family. So um, one of the things that we know about 
illness and injury is that it can create a lot of social isolation. Um, people sometimes pull away because it's an awkward situation. They don't know how to help. They want to help, but they can't, or it's, it's, very, it's just very stressful, you know, um, and, and relationships can shut down. So this is a multiplayer game, so it can, it can tap into your Facebook, your SMS, your Twitter, um, and get your friends and family re-engaged um, with what you're going through, but in a way that's of an unnecessary obstacle, right, instead of this horrible thing that's happened to you. Um, you invite people to play a game with you instead of asking them to take care of you, so reduce the stress of caretaking. Um, so, and, and we want it to be very accessible, so depending on where you are, you know, some people who we've had test the game are playing it in hospitals, right, so then it's like really nice to have on an iPad. Some people are playing it with their grandparents, and then it's good to have, you know, uh, have it on a normal computer screen, right, so. As you, you use a game to do something more serious, um, at what point does it become something that you're doing as a job? And where can you draw that boundary where it's like, well, we're, we're trying to solve a real problem and we're using game to solve that real problem, but then when, when you actually put it into action, someone has to execute that. And how do, how do you, is that uh, something that you see as a line that's being pushed in one direction or the other? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's important not to put real results um, on, on some other side of the spectrum from gameplay. Um, you can do things that have real results um, and have it still be a game, but you have to keep that sense of voluntary participation and unnecessary obstacles. Um, the sort of, I love the golf example because it shows you the sort of level of absurdity that's required in order to gamify something that's truly hard. I mean, it's, it's not that hard to gamify things that people already like to do. And like Foursquare is a good example in that people like to go out with their friends and they like to go out to bars and restaurants. Um, so that's, that's fairly easy to gamify, um, to get people to do it more. Um, I did a project called World Without Oil where we were trying to get people to radically reduce um, their dependence on oil. And we ran a six week simulation where we had people live their real lives as if we had gone through a peak oil scenario. Um, they had to document it through blogs and, and social media and videos. And uh, it would normally be very hard to get people to radically reduce their carbon footprint, radically reduce their dependence on oil. But because we had a fictional story and we posed it as a challenge, can you survive these six weeks? It became voluntary and, op and optional. We had a narrative, we had a community that was gonna band together and do this survive together. And that got people engaged. It had real world effects and real world consequences. But we started with that very, very, you have to buy in as a, as a volunteer for a challenge. Okay, so <clears throat> imagine if you're starting a company now, you also don't want to um, be sustainable and make money and have a business. Um, and so one question we have on Twitter is, um, I lost it, they're streaming in, um, is uh, it, was, it was about do you also care about revenue and, and how do you incorporate that into making one of these games? Do I care about revenue? Yes, <laughs> because uh, I want to have a job making these games and somebody's got to make money off of them to be uh, employed. So um, you know, what, one thing that we're doing at, at Social Chocolate, we're making a number of games um, and we're, uh, we're, we're really inspired by the virtual goods economy. We're inspired by virtual goods that are tied to real world causes so that when you're spending money, that portion of it goes to real world causes. Um, and so we, we are looking to implement sort of the whole, the whole economy of gaming. Um, it, the, the, I guess there are sort of two different approaches to gamification, right? One is to gamify getting people to spend money on something, and the other is making a game that serves your real world purpose, enhances your brand, or um, gets people solving a real world problem and then find ways to get people to spend money to play the game. Because if you're making a real game and it's really gameful, then you'll be able to charge players the same way that you would be able to charge them for a you know, traditional entertainment game. And I think that's something that um, we, might be, we might be overlooking. You know, gamification is not just about getting people to do stuff that supports the bottom line. That, that could wind up feeling like you're exploiting gamers, I feel. Um, but actually making games that inspire people to spend money because they're so awesome, that to me seems a more sustainable model. 
Okay, uh, Justin the Wit wants to know, what are you uninspired by in the gaming world? What are some negative trends? What am I uninspired by? Um, I don't know if I can admit this in public. <laughs> what can I say? Um, <laughs> no, I can't, because uh, whatever I say will insult somebody that I love. I mean, uh, <laughs> more... I'm more inspired by cooperative gameplay than I am by competitive gameplay, I would say. And one of the most interesting trends in, in the gamer world um, over the last few years has been that now gamers report preferring competitive, uh, co cooperative gameplay to competitive uh, on an order of three to one. And I think uh, when, when I get pitched a lot of gamification ideas, um, a, lot of, a lot of times competition is part of it. You'll compete with your friends, you'll compete for status, you'll compete for something. If you look at what's actually happening in gaming, most of the players don't want to compete. They want to cooperate. They want to work with their friends to achieve a common goal or to overcome a common obstacle. Um, and uh, the games that are pushing co-op are doing extraordinarily well. And I think it's worth you know, I, I really think everyone who's working in gamification should be looking at what's making the entertainment gamers happy as a signal for, uh, for what's going on. You know, another thing that's really exploding in the game industry is a backlash against achievement badges. Um, there are a lot of game designers and gamers who feel like they distract from the authentic experience of playing a game. And I think it would be really bad news for the gamification field to rally behind a, uh, 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 an element of games that actually gamers are turning away from. You know, if they're turning away from it in an entertainment game world, it's because it's not actually fun and rewarding. And I think we need to be very careful to keep our eye on what is, what is you know, increasing popularity and it being revealed to not actually drive gameful experiences so that we can be borrowing the right elements and not, um, not marrying ourselves to, to ones that are actually maybe not so good. Uh, that still counts. Clock, <laughs> clock's still going on the game. <laughs> um, so, so you didn't actually diss anyone there. Um, I, no, I totally did. I mean, but not by name. So. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, okay, one that came up a couple times is um, what games do you play regularly and how much time do you actually spend gaming? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, the time I spend playing games is directly proportional to how stressed out I am in my real life. I play much more games when I'm stressed out um, because... Uh, because I'm totally a typical gamer and I, I need that you stress. I need to go from being feeling attacked by the world to feeling like in charge of the world. Um, so yeah, so I do a lot of Facebook Zynga games because I like um, you know, my friend uh, who, who makes social games, she calls them personal happy spaces um, where you're just in control and nobody comes and clobbers you with the bad guy and you just make this beautiful thing and you work, work, work and you win, win, win. Um, so, so I'm a big fan of, of you know, games like Farmville and Cityville, even though they're, um, they're, they're not big, sprawling, and epic. Um, for big, sprawling, and epic, uh, World of Warcraft always has a place in my heart. I don't play it anymore. I stopped playing it when I started writing the book so that I could have all the time I needed to write the book. Um, but I still think that if, if there are people who haven't actually sat down and played that game, uh, you need to spend a day playing that game um, because uh, you can't explain how good it feels until, uh, until you've actually... Am I right? Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, amen. And then I, I love dance games. So dance games are the only games I'm better at than my husband. So uh, I'm a big fan of the dance games. And I like to watch my husband play Fallout games because uh, I don't know. But I'm not good at them. I, don't, I can't kill things. I'm worse at dance games than my husband, even though I'm better at dancing than my husband. Um, <laughs> well, in, when you look, though, at... at um, social gaming platforms and mobile gaming platforms and the way they're evolving um, and the incredible growth that you can see right now um, when you get onto them. How, how might you t take advantage of that and how does that compare to the history of games that you've studied? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the best thing that we're seeing is that people are using games to stay connected with people they care about, that these games have kind of two purposes. They have the personal purpose of I feel good when I play this game, but they have this sort of added utility of 
and I've checked in with my mom today, you know, and uh, even though I don't work with these people anymore because I, you know, I work at a different office, I'm still in touch with them, you know, every week and I feel like there's still social ties. And I think that that added benefit of games is taking us closer to where games are no longer an escape from reality. They're, uh, they're adding to our real lives. You know, I, where I hope to see games go, games of all kinds, both gamified games and traditional entertainment games, is that they support our real life goals of, of you know, strengthening our relationships or improving our fitness or making us more ambitious um, or just having all the positive emotions that we want. Um, but so I think that's the best part of social games is that it's, it's making them, it's making games real in the way that they connect us to real world friends and family. You're also invited to ask questions at the mic. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you have to sit at your computer and ask me a question when you're all right here. Um, <laughs> maybe I do too much game playing and focus on my laptop. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I just got to level 44 in Citadel last night and I felt really bad about myself, I have to say. You felt bad? I did, I did, because um, I... Uh, I, I want to have positive reinforcement from other things in my life than like... Oh, yeah, well, so here, okay, this is like actually a big deal, right? There's a big study that came out that's really controversial, and a lot of game developers like want to pretend that it doesn't exist, <laughs> and I'm not saying for sure that the science is totally valid. People are looking at it now, it has to be replicated. Big study came out this week um, looking at the connection between uh, excessive gameplay, which they calculated more than 20 hours a week, and depression, anxiety, and social phobia. Not that you have any of these. But looking at young people um, who play more than 20 hours a week, if they are prone to depression, anxiety, or social phobia, that the game becomes such a powerful source of reward, success, social connection, that they are seem to be demotivated from trying to uh, pursue social connections in real life or to do well in school or to solve a real world problem that um, the game does such a good job of offsetting all of that that it can create a kind of a spiral away from um, actually dealing with these problems. If you play for less than 20 hours a week it appears to help treat them and get you through the, the dark times and then get you back to reality. Um, but I think this is a really important study. There have been a number of studies that show if you play more than 20 hours a week, um, it can create problems. Um, but uh, so that's interesting to me to think about right now, games take us away from reality if we play them too much. If we gamify the world and the games are connected to real schools and real jobs and, and real spaces and, and real goals, um, then maybe 20 hours a week will no longer be the tipping point. Maybe we'll be able to play for 40 hours a week and it will be... Uh, be as good for us as it is to play 20 hours a week now. Sorry, I don't have Twitter. Um, are, are there things... <laughs> I, I don't know, I just stumbled in. <laughs> um, that doesn't count. <laughs> but I have a lot of free time in my life, it's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> and I get things done. <laughs> But I know a lot of people who have way too much free time in their lives because they're unemployed. And they're sort of the opposite of these things. They're no longer optimistic. They don't, nothing seems to be urgent in their lives anymore. They're far from uh, blissful. They're not productive. They, they might have been productive two years ago when somebody was managing their time. But are there games now or in production or is it the kind of thing you would consider that would help take a person through the process of what they have to do to get a job or perhaps reinvent themselves with marketable skills, the things that people would want, so that they can m get pleasure out of the process oh, that it yeah. takes to get to the point where somebody will not reject them and hire them. Yeah, that is something. a super cool idea and it is tremendously needed. I mean, I've heard a number of people talk about the need for a game for people who are unemployed and figuring out what the next step is. Um, the best game that, example that I think you could actually look at now and play um, that could serve as a kind of inspiration for doing that is a game that I helped make last year for the World Bank Institute called Evoke, E-V-O-K-E. Yay. <laughs> um, Evoke is a 10-week crash course in changing the world, we call it. Um, it teaches you how to start your own social enterprise, to start a business um, wherever you are to solve a problem like you know food security or, or clean water access. We originally aimed it at 
young people in sub-Saharan Africa. And what happened when we launched the game is we had all of these people in the United States who were unemployed or underemployed or millennials who graduate from college and are one, the one in three who never found the job play the game, which we hadn't made it for that group of people. But they're like, we need, we need jobs. We need to start enterprises. We don't know how to do this, and we want those skills too. Um, so you can actually look and see all of the work they did. And by the way, the players um, actually created more than 50 real world businesses as a result that got funding through global giving, that got mentorship. And so 10 weeks, 50 companies out of one game um, was, uh, was really a good sign that you could actually do something like this. So it, you also mentioned like students, the one in three that don't get jobs. College, in my opinion, is a really poorly designed game. Yeah. Right? There's a score, the GPA, there are badges, courses, and stuff like that. But I interview kids coming out of college, and they lack things. Purpose, yeah. they don't have uh, trusting relationships, they haven't, uh, they would score very low on integrity. Has anyone worked on that? How, how do yeah. we create a game out of creating a meaningful life and of integrity, yeah. honesty, yeah, yeah. purpose? in the well, real world. Yes, so I don't want to, by the way, I don't want to stand between people and their lunch. That's like the worst place to be in the world. But I would say on Gameful, there's a very large group, hundreds of educators who are looking at this question for elementary, high school, and college education for reinventing it to a game. There's a ton of experiments being done. And so if you're interested in finding all those people in one place um, on Gameful, there's a group for educators. Who are doing and we're that. just saying, hey, we're gonna take one more question. This is the last question before break. Hey Liz, hey Jane, I'm, I'm Schneider Mike, I'll, I'll try to make it good. Um, beyond the obvious, get people together and test the idea, and, and, and like play, like pr prototype. Um, what ideas do you have for testing into fun before people empty their bank accounts? For, for like te testing into whether an idea is fun or it's gonna be sticky or the, the game's actually gonna be viable before people just start to go hog wild and invest. Oh yeah. Um, no, I mean we do we do play testing, um, and I mean I, you said besides play testing, but I'll tell you what we did over the holidays um, with Social Chocolate. You know we just started working full time in December on this company. So when the holidays came up, we sent everyone in the company, no matter what their role in the company, you know the CEO, the chairwoman, down to the you know the um, the person taking notes at meetings. Sorry. Everybody had a packet of um, twelve games to play test with friends and family over the holidays with as many diverse people as they could find, you know, age diverse, gender diverse, personality diverse. Um, and we had a, a system where you reported back on all different kinds of variables. We were asking people to say, you know, one word emotion for how they felt after they did this play test. We were, um, we were tracking lots of different things. And, so uh, you're building like paper prototypes or, or prototypes of, you know, yeah, so, some of them or? were paper prototypes mm -hmm. of mechanics. Some of them we built little digital widgets online that you could go to and use, very scaled down, cheap things that took mm -hmm. you know a day to make, um, and, uh, and 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 just tried to use our own social networks to get as as diverse a group as possible. Um, to it's play not test. magic then, basically. No, it's not magic. Yeah. But you, do, it's you know, we learn the most uh, from asking people. I I learn the most from asking people, uh, you know, how they feel afterwards not necessarily for what they like or don't like, because as a game designer, you can, you can, you can, you know how to work with feelings, and they're not game designers, so they don't really know how to make a better game, but they do know how they feel better than anyone else, and they can tell you what they didn't like feeling, what they did like feeling, and I find that so useful. And you're going for that euphoria, so, the use stress thing, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, can come. <laughs> so, all right, so everybody, I, I wanna let you know about a couple of things uh, right now. Lunch is served outside. You can also visit uh, the Borders book stand in the corner and get the first live signatures on Jane's new book.